Kia ora everyone, I'm TJ, welcome back to my channel New Zealand Mysteries. If you are new around here and you want to become part of a compassionate, caring community who want to raise awareness about cases and seek answers for victims and their families, you are in the right place. So please hit that subscribe button somewhere down there and join us. If you are a returning subscriber, many thanks, you know how I really appreciate each and every one of you. So I'm taking a break after releasing part two in my Scott Watson deep dive. If you haven't already, please watch it. You might find out info that you've never heard before. And I hope to release the last part in a week or so. In this video, we're looking at the murder of 66-year-old Sydney Boyd in Christchurch in 2006. This is a really sad case that has barely had any media at all. In fact, I have only managed to find one article on this case. It does remain unsolved. This is definitely a story that needs our help. We need to share it as much as we can. It really deserves more attention. So quickly before I get started, I genuinely don't mean any disrespect or grief to anyone involved in the cases I cover. All the information I use is freely available on the internet and my hope and my dream is to just raise awareness of these cases, keep them alive and I really wish we could help find some answers. Let's get into it. And sorry about my phone, by the way. This case happens in Christchurch. It is the largest city in the South Island of New Zealand and the seat of the Canterbury region. The Christchurch urban area lies on the South Island's east coast, just north of Banks Peninsula. The urban area is home to 383-200 residents and the Territorial Authority has 394,000 people, which makes it the second most populous city in New Zealand after Auckland and before Wellington. The Avon River flows through the centre of the city with an urban park located along its banks. The city suffered a series of earthquakes between September 2010 and Ju January 2012, with the most destructive of them occurring at 12.51pm on 22nd of February 2011 in which 185 people were killed and thousands of buildings across the city collapsed or suffered severe damage. By late 2013, 1,500 buildings in the city have been demolished, leading to an ongoing recovery and build rebuilding project. The city later became the site of a terrorist attack targeting two mosques on 15th of March 2019, in which 51 people were killed and which was described by Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern as one of New Zealand's darkest days. This is where Christchurch sits on the east of the South Island. Christchurch sure has had its terrible times. All right, let's look into our case. I'm really, really lucky that stuff.co.nz did an amazing interactive article on this case because if it wasn't for them we wouldn't even know about it um, so we're going to just read straight from their interactive and I want to thank them for their amazing work Broken Glass Who Killed Sydney Boyd Sydney Boyd died after he was pushed through a window in a block of flats and fell to the ground below in 2006 Suspicion fell on three men, two of whom are now dead. His family fear is too late to catch his colour. Sam Sherwood and Blair Ensor investigate. Hopefully it's not too late. You know, maybe we can give the family some answers still. Okay, so these were the flats in a housing New Zealand complex on Rickerton Road. That's a social housing um, outfit. They now uh, changed their name. <laughs> Sorry, it just goes over my head what it's called now um, I'll have to find that out after dark in the stairwell of a block of Christchurch flats two men were arguing one of them was Sydney Boyd a 66 year old cat lover who some tenants in the housing New Zealand complex called the bank because of his willingness to lend money it wasn't unusual for shouting and yelling to echo around the building which was home to drunks drug addicts and those who'd fallen on hard times. That's definitely not to say that all housing New Zealand tenants or social housing tenants um, fall into that category. There are a lot, certainly a lot that don't. After a brief pause in the dispute, glass was heard shattering. Trent Revel, a tenant in the building at 281 Rickerton Road, rang triple one, 
about 8.30pm on May 23, 2006 and told the operator there'd been an incident. You'd better hurry, he said. Some guy just went flying out of a first story window. I think he's dead. He's right outside my effing door. Revel lived at flat 38, which was on the ground floor of C Block, one of three identical three-storey blocks at the social housing complex. In the background, the operator could hear the sound of a television. Revel said, you better send the cops as well. He'd been watching Sensing Murder. The guy upstairs threw him out of the window. Revel told the operator he'd heard two men arguing before the incident. One of them told the other to F off repeatedly, shortly before a window shattered and the guy landed in front of me. Emergency services arrived a short time later to find Boyd lying on the ground at the entrance to C Block. Shards of reinforced glass from an 81cm by 77cm window in the building stairwell were scattered on the concrete around him. He had fallen about 2.1 metres and was bleeding heavily from a gash in his head but was conscious and able to talk. He knew his first name but couldn't immediately recall his last. Paramedic Wayne asked Boyd what had happened. He said he'd been in a fight and was pushed out the window but was unable to name his attacker. Boyd was taken to Christchurch Hospital where his condition deteriorated and his family was told to expect the worst. So this is uh, Sydney Boyd's family and what an awful call to get on that night and uh, to see their loved one like he was. In the weeks that followed, he slowly emerged from an induced coma and communicated with his sister who probed in for information about the incident. However, hope turned to despair 38 days after Boyd's fall when he died unexpectedly from a rare complication of a procedure that had been carried out to help him breathe. It should have not have been difficult or a difficult crime to solve, but a lack of credible witnesses and forensic evidence and a failing by police mean his attacker has not been caught. Detectives focused their inquiries on three C Block residents, Trent Revel, Todd and Glenn. A coroner later ruled one or more of the men held the key to solving the case. Two of them have died in the past two years, and this came out, I think, in 2020. I'll have a check before we finish. Boyd's family fear it's too late to catch his killer, but remain hopeful they'll learn who was responsible. His family said he got no justice for what he suffered. He had a miserable, long death. And that was from Carol Boyd, his sister. Stuff has obtained never-before-released material about the cold case, including witness statements and scene photographs gathered as part of the police investigation. Police have confirmed a senior investigator was recently tasked with reviewing the file in the coming months. The review was initiated after Stuff contacted the officer in charge of the initial investigation and alerted him to Revel's death last year. He was the oldest of the three children, and um, animal lover, absolute animal lover, and um, bossy, the oldest brother. And um, he was bright, he was very, very bright at school, did very, very well at school. Sorry that my computer is not good enough to run that, uh, but obviously I will have sources in the description box below so you can go and watch the video yourself. But we'll cover what's in it. Sydney Boyd was the eldest of four children, was born in Ashburton about 80 k south of Christchurch. At school where he became known as Super Sid, he was a bright student with a flair for art, his family says. He also loved to dance, had a passion for horse riding and particularly show jumping. At the age of 17, his life took a turn for the worse when he suffered a brain bleed while cross country training or cross country running. He was rushed to Dunedin Hospital and underwent urgent surgery. He developed epilepsy, epilepsy in the months following that incident. 
Despite suffering seizures, Boyd secured employment at various Ashburton businesses, including a brickmaker and an electricity supplier. He also married, but the relationship failed. Boyd shifted to the Rickerton Road complex in about 2000, after an Ashburton Housing New Zealand flat he shared with another man was accidentally burned to the ground. An animal lover, he kept two cats and filled his room with the three large fish tanks. He was also a familiar face at local thrift shops. However, life wasn't easy for him at the flats, says her sister. Her timid brother often felt threatened and frightened by residents, despite going out of his way to help some of them. Boyd was hounded by people wanting to borrow money, even though he often didn't have enough to travel to Ashburton to see his family. He wasn't happy there at the complex, but that's what was offered to him and that's where he had to stay. On the night of his fall, Boyd walked the short distance from his A block home to C block, where he'd arranged to meet fellow resident Glenn Green, who lived in flat 43 for a cup of tea. Green had borrowed money from Boyd and owed him about 30 bucks. As Boyd entered the building, it appears he unplugged an extension cord that ran from a shared laundry area into Revel's room on the ground floor. He then began making his way up the stairs to Green's flat, which was on the first floor. Residents gave different accounts of the events that followed. When police arrived, Revel, who'd lived in the complex for about three years, emerged from his flat and spoke to Constable Deborah Wilson. A sickness beneficiary, he'd had issues with drugs and alcohol and was known to police. According to police records, Revel told Constable Wilson that he was checking his washing on a clothesline outside when Boyd, whom he didn't know, walked past him and into C-block. A short time later, he noticed the extension cord was slack and found it unplugged. Revel marched up the stairs looking for the culprit and found Boyd just waiting around in the stairwell on the first floor. To his surprise, Boyd confirmed he'd unplugged the cord and then started verbally having a go at me, he said. He said it was like he was drunk or simple. He was swearing at me a lot and told me to bugger off. Revel said he told Boyd, told Boyd to piss off before turning to head back to his room. It was then that the door to flat 44, which was on the first floor, opened. He told Wilson he did not see anyone emerge, but heard the distinctive Canadian accent of a man who lived there. Revel said the man, who he did not know by name, talked to Boyd about how he was over here causing trouble again, before saying three times, do you want to have a go? He said he then heard a crash bang noise and I saw the old guy hit the ground outside. As soon as that happened, the door to flat 44 shut. Nothing was said after that. Revel said he checked Boyd after the fall and realising he was in a bad way, rang triple one from his room. He remained there until emergency services arrived. The man who lived in flat 44 was Todd Sillinger, a former Papua Nui High School head boy who was born in Canada and moved to New Zealand when he was about 10 years old. According to police records, he told Constable Stephen Rockford that he was watching a British Army program on television when he heard two males going at each other outside his flat. He recognised both voices. He said one was Boyd's, the other, which was nasally and Australian-like, belonged to Revel. That's what he told Rockford. The pair were arguing about a power cord. They were yelling at each other, but in these places you get used to that. The dispute lasted a minute. I yelled out, piss off you perverts, shortly after I heard glass shattering. Sillinger said he opened his door and made his way down to the stairs directly in front of his flat. He said, I saw the window in the stairwell smashed and could hear snoring, tight breathing and knew something was wrong. He looked out the broken window and saw a man lying face down on the ground below. He said, I went down and found Sid breathing heavily and trying to speak. I couldn't understand what he was trying to say. After attempting 
to put Boyd in the recovery position so he didn't suffocate on the blood pooling around his head, Salinger said he went to get help. He rang Revel's doorbell, but there was no response, so he went to the room of a nearby resident and asked him to ring triple one. When Salinger went back outside, he saw a car drive away from the car park, but didn't see what type it was. Emergency services arrived short time later. Police spoke briefly to Glenn Green, the man Boyd had arranged to visit, who said he'd been home all night. He'd heard a noise about the time of Boyd's fall, but didn't know what it was. Three days later, Green told Detective Doran Ho that on the night of the incident, he'd nodded off to sleep in his flat and was woken by the sound of people shouting in the stairwell. He said, I heard a door slam, then I heard someone say, you, really loudly. Then the arguing started. At first, he didn't recognise any of the voices involved in the dispute. At one point, he thought he heard a third person, a man, tell them to fuck off. They were swearing at each other. Then I realised that one of the voices was Sid's because I heard him say, I'm only up here for a cup of tea. Green recalled someone saying, stick your dukes up, shortly before things went quiet. He said, then I heard a thud. I didn't hear the sound of glass breaking, I just heard a thud. He remained in his room until he heard what sounded like police radios downstairs a bit, about 10 minutes later. Just quickly before we move on, if you have any information on this case or any other cases that I cover, please call Crime Stoppers. Oh my gosh, my, my mouth mush is terrible. Please call Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 one. You can call 105 or go to your local police station. nzmissing at gmail.com if you want to send me case suggestions. And please pop over to our Facebook page, New Zealand Mysteries. We have a great community there. It's really wonderful. If you can support the channel with a $3 donation for a coffee, please go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash nzmysteries. I have a lot of uh, uh, subscriptions I have to pay for newspapers, newspapers to, to get, get information. information. Um, I, I pay, pay for, for stories to be paid on Facebook so they can reach hundreds more people. So that's where your donations go. They're really important to me. All that information will be in the description box below. Very important though, please like this video and subscribe to the channel and share this out when you can. These may be little things to you, but for the channel it means a hell of a lot and makes sure that the stories get seen uh, around more people. So thank you all. Everyone, I really appreciate every part, every bit of support that you give me. Let's get back into it. Assistance detective work. Despite being able to talk at the scene, Sydney Boyd had suffered serious injuries, including a broken neck, a neck and a brain bleed. In the days after he was admitted to the hospital's intensive care unit, his condition deteriorated and he was placed in an induced coma. Doctors and family feared he might not survive the week. However, Boyd's condition slowly improved to the point he was conscious and able to communicate with people with his hands. He was unable to talk because he was breathing through a tube that had been inserted into his windpipe. On June 20, nearly a month after the incident, his sister, Carol, visited her brother with a, f a photo of C-Block. Keen to find out who had pushed him through the window, she pointed to a flat on the ground floor and asked, Was it 38? Residents at the social housing complex had told the family that Trent Revel, the man who lived there, was aggressive and the incident might have had something to do with a power cord running from the laundry to his unit. But Boyd shook his head. Three days later, Boyd Wilson, the sister, returned with her mother and her brother's ex-wife. Boyd was wide awake and smiled at them as they entered the hospital room. Boyd Wilson said to her brother, Who did it? His hand shook as he wrote the number 43 on a pad she'd bought with her. His sister then showed her brother an enlarged photo she'd taken of the flats, which she'd numbered on the outside. He pointed to the number 43 and the flat where Glen Green lived on the first floor. 
How many people pushed you? She asked. He held up two fingers. She asked him again whether it was the person who lived in flat 38. He shook his head and pointed upwards. She contacted Constable Deborah Wilson on June 26 and told her about the information she'd extracted from her brother and suggested police pay him a visit. That hadn't happened when Boyd died unexpectedly on July 1st as a result of a rare complication from a tracheotomy which caused major blood loss. There was no fault on the part of those involved in his treatment, a pathologist said. Despite the setback, police continued to search for answers for the family, re-interviewing Revel, Green and Salinger. All three men either changed their stories or volunteered new information. So who's telling the truth? Revel's later statements were inconsistent with what he'd told police on the night of the incident. Two things in particular stood out. First, he told Detective Sergeant Jeff Ruddock, the officer in charge of the investigation, that he'd seen the man from Flat 44 emerge from his room immediately prior to Boyd's fall. Previously, he'd said he'd only heard his voice. Revel told Ruddock he did not see the man push Boyd out of the window, but there were only two of them on the landing. Second, Revel told police that rather than tending to his washing prior to arguing with Boyd, as he'd said in his first statement, he was watching television when his fridge and heater lost power. He went outside to investigate what had happened, saw Boyd walking up the stairs and confronted him about the unplugged extension cord. Salinger, when he was re-interviewed in February 2007, said that a few days after Boyd's fall, Green, who he hardly knew, asked him if Revel had been arrested yet and mentioned a Māori man had visited Revel that same night. Green, in one of several additional statements to police, said he thought the man arguing with Boyd immediately before he went through the window was a big set Māori guy because of the guy's voice, not Revel. Revel's statements make no mention of anyone visiting him on the night of the incident. Police were unable to find anyone to corroborate any of the accounts from Revel, Selinger or Green. A detective's regret. In November 2008, Coroner Richard McAuley held an inquest into Sydney Boyd's death. The coroner asked Ruddock why police did not try to talk to Boyd in hospital prior to his death. He said, I was always of the opinion that Sydney Boyd was going to get better. I probably should have gone to see him in ICU, but I didn't. I have to live with that. Ruddock told the inquest it was unlikely anyone would be charged over Boyd's death, which he did not believe was an accident. McElroy included or concluded that the evidence provided by Revel and Green was not reliable. He accepted, with some hesitation, that Salinger's version of events was true. The coroner said it was unlikely Revel retreated down the stairs after arguing with Boyd about the unplugged power cord. It was possible that a visitor to the complex, known to Revel and Green, was responsible for his ejection through the window. He said, I find that Sidney Boyd was pushed, causing him to tumble down the stairs with such force that the reinforced glass was broken and he fell headfirst to the ground below. The question as to who pushed Sidney Boyd in this manner, resulting in injuries that lead to his death, remains unsolved. Sidney Boyd's fatal fall never made big banner headlines. Almost nothing has been written about it for a decade. At the Rickerton Road complex where he lived, few residents know his name or anything about his death. Most of the people who knew him have either relocated or died. As memories of the incident have faded, so too have hopes of a resolution. Salinger suffered a fatal heart attack in October 2018, aged 56. His family has always believed he was not involved in Boyd's death and say the coroner's report exonerated him. Kyle Salinger says he believes his sibling, who was horrified about the whole bloody thing, was the victim of an unfortunate set of circumstances. He said, I know that my brother wouldn't have done something like that, 
If anything, he was a peacemaker. Revel, who was a morphine user and suffered from hepatitis C, was found unresponsive in his flat at the Rickerton Road complex on April 9 last year. So it would have been 2019. He died the next day, aged 56. The pathologist concluded the cause of his death was multi-organ failure, a coroner's finding says. Those who knew Revel, who grew up in Linwood, a suburb of Christchurch, says he kept to himself in his latter years and rarely left home. The second youngest of five siblings, he was largely estranged from his family, including his two daughters, both of whom were removed from his care when they were young. Revel became addicted to painkillers after his leg was crushed in a car crash as a teenager. His older brother, who does not want to be identified, says he was never the same after that. That's what started his foray into the local underworld because he needed to source drugs. He lived in those seedy circles because he, because he had to survive. Revel's brother, who had heard rumours of the incident involving Boyd, struggles to rationalise him as a killer. Standing about 1.8 metres tall, he was slim and wore a leg brace after the crash. He said although he lived an unfortunate life that had many bumps, he wasn't a thug. Exhausted efforts by staff to contact Green, who until very recently lived in a housing New Zealand flat in Dunedin, were unsuccessful. The 66-year-old who lives a transient lifestyle has barely been in touch with his three siblings since their mother died about a decade ago. Diagnosed with schizophrenia, he has an eye condition which significantly impacts his sight, although I don't know that his diagnosis of schizophrenia has anything to do with um, the story at all. Wayne Green is adamant his older brother, whose life was marred by drug use, was not involved in Boyd's death. He did more harm to himself than others. He was actually a kind-hearted person. I believed him when he said he didn't see it happen because he was inside his flat. Canterbury District Crime Manager Detective Inspector Greg Morton says he's unable to talk about the case until the review he's commissioned has been completed. Carol Boyd Wilson, his sister, has a few physical memories of her brother, apart from a handful of photographs and an old family album. She's angry the identity of killer, his killer remains unknown. It's unfair someone can do something so bad and get away with it. She is frustrated detectives didn't try to talk to her brother in hospital before his death. However, she's sceptical about whether he would have provided them with the information needed to solve the case. The 76-year-old believes her brother was confused during her interactions with him in hospital. When he pointed to room 43, she thinks he was indicating where he was going rather than revealing who attacked him. She says she formed the view that Revel pushed her brother through the window. She provides little foundation for that belief other than he was the one with the vicious and fighting personality and accepts it's likely she'll never have a definitive answer. The pensioner who lives in Wellington thinks about her brother often, particularly at family events and what he's missed out on. She doesn't like to look at a bold portrait of him smiling through a long grey wispy beard. It's a painful reminder of his final days at the Rickerton Road complex. Instead, she thinks back to the young athletic teen whose life showed plenty of promise. She says he suffered a long and frightening death. It's sad that was how his life ended. Very sad case. Um, I really feel for his family and I don't know if there's much that we can do to help, but I want to try. So please share um, this where you can as far as you can let's get some people seeing it he deserves more than one just one article uh, done on him or written about him I think that's just incredibly sad thank you for every way you help the channel uh, and help the cause whether it's liking subscribing sharing watching or donating I appreciate each and every one of you please be safe be kind and I will see you in the next video. Bye guys.